This is my Ring of Honor Cage Collision pay-per-view review. The pay-per-view had its first airing last night. This was taped back on January 31st, 2009 of this year from Chicago, Illinois. And this is going to be one of those pay-per-views that no one's probably going to say it's great. No one's going to say it's really terrible. This is more or less just an average Ring of Honor show, Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Um, going in, I wasn't really expecting anything great from this. I know some people might have been disappointed from this pay-per-view, but there was at least a few good things from it, and this is one of those that you know I wouldn't highly recommend. But if you got you know ten, fifteen dollars to spare, and you just want to check out a Ring of Honor show, and you're you know a die-hard Ring of Honor fan, those are the people that I would you know recommend this to. But for the most part, this is one of those shows that if you don't see it and you don't order it, you're not going to really miss too much. Um, the opening matchup was uh, Kenny King, Silas Young and Alex Payne in a three-way. This was actually a pretty good opener. I would have much rather seen Silas Young and Kenny King in a singles match because I'm not a fan of any of the Ring of Honor students, especially Alex Payne. I do not like that Ring of Honor tries to push him a little too hard, especially when he's on the Chicago shows. I know he's from Chicago, but still, I don't think that many people really care about seeing him actually in a ring and seeing him push. He's a guy that you should use just as you know a squash guy, or, you know, a guy that's used on a pre-show, not, you know, on a pay-per-view. Um, Kenny King and Silas Young, when they were in the ring, you saw some good back-and-forth stuff with them. It's a pretty solid opener. What well, didn't go that long. Um, unfortunately, one person I think everyone didn't want to see won, and that is um, Alex Payne. Alex Payne won with a uh, Hurricane Rana into a roll-up onto Silas Young. Pretty solid opener, though. I would give it about two and a half stars. Then after this, uh, they aired a little video package preview of the next match. For Claudio Castagnoli and Kevin Steen, which I thought was a pretty good video package. Then the next matchup was Claudio Castagnoli versus Kevin Steen. And this match should have been very good. It's, it was pretty much a decent match. Uh, but with these two, you would expect something pretty great out of them. But the ending of the match was kind of the thing that kind of hurt this match, in my opinion. Uh, I know a lot of people probably say this match started off pretty slow. Then it started building up and actually getting good with the last couple minutes of the match, and if this would have been given probably five, six more minutes, and it would have had a uh, clean finish, this could probably could have been a very, very good match with them, but fortunately they went with kind of a screwy ending here with uh, Larry Sweeney coming out there, pretty much distracting the ref, and El Generico comes out there, tried to get Larry Sweeney out of there and get the match back started with the, without uh, Claudio Castanoli doing some cheap tactics to uh, Kevin Steen pick up the victory. Uh, the ref was still turned. Cast, uh, Kevin Steen was still kind of staring that way. Zell Generico came out there and Larry Schwinney was out there. He was still distracted. Then Claudio uh, was able to uh, get him in position for the Ricola bomb, hit him with the Ricola bomb. Ref turned around, one, two, three. So that's the way the match ended with Claudio Castanoli going over. Um, it kind of made sense for Claudio Castanoli's heel persona that they would have done something like that, but I think it would have been much better if it would have had a little better ending and maybe would have been given a little more time because it was really starting to pick up to be in a good match the last couple minutes of the match. But the ending really hurt the match, in my opinion. I'll give it about two and three, four stars. So I was kind of expecting a little more from them, too, in that match. Uh, then after this, they went backstage uh, uh, with Kyle Durden with an interview with uh, Alex Payne. And then Nigel McGinnis came in there, interrupted it. And pretty much Lariat, Alex Payne. So then Nigel McGinnis did a promo. Very great promo from Nigel McGinnis here. Really enjoyed it. Uh, this was pretty much uh, what he, why he did this to Alex Payne. And Larry to him, he got him out and took his spot right there. And that interview was, you know, back at the last pay-per-view, rising above. Alex Payne trying to come out there and kind of cost the match for Nigel McGinnis. Was kind of restarting the match when Nigel was doing the uh, cheap tactic, trying to get the count out with him and Danielson in that match. And Nigel... Uh, Alex Payne came out there and helped Dan Danielson get back to the ring, and um, pretty much that was payback for him. So you saw, you know, pay-per-view continuation there with the storyline there, so that was good to see. Uh, then the next matchup was uh, Jerry Lynn and Necro Butcher teaming up to take on um, Age of the Fall members Delirious and Brody Lee. And this was just an average tag match. This wasn't anything great. Um, it was just pretty much just there. That's what you would say about this match. Uh, the end of the match saw um, there was a table placed outside the ring. Uh, Necker Butcher placed Bird Lee on it. He got on the ring apron to leg, uh, leg drop through the table. Uh, before that, back in the ring with uh, Jerry Lynn and Delirious. Delirious went for the shadows over, over hell. 
Jerry Lynn moved out the way. Then Jerry Lynn wins the match, uh, hitting the cradle pile driver on Delirious. And about another, you know, two and a half star match. It was just, you know, pretty much an average match between these two. Then after the match, Jimmy Jacobs was out there in the corner of Brody Lee and Delirious. He comes to the ring, blames the loss on Delirious, and uh, berates him. Then um, Daisy Hayes comes out there. She's uh, got the railroad spike, pulls it out, tries to uh, hit Jimmy Jacobs. Jimmy Jacobs moves out the way, and she accidentally hits Delirious. This was before Delirious turned back into being a face. I think he uh, turned face at one of the shows in March, maybe even... Yeah, I think that's the time when he uh, turned face sometime at one of the March shows, and this was just kind of like leading up to that. You could tell at some point they were going to turn Delirious back into a face, which I liked his Hill persona, but it did kind of, it was good at first, then it kind of fell flat, and I'm glad they do got him back as a face right now, because it kind of he kind of works better as a face, especially with, uh, you know, crowd interaction and stuff like that, instead of being a heel, even though he kind of could go, you know, that creepy eerie persona with the Age of the Fall worked out for the beginning, but then it kind of fell flat, like I said. Then um, the next matchup uh, was the uh, attentively scheduled, it was going to be a tag team match, which was um, Austin Aries and Jimmy Jacobs teaming up to take on Danielson and Tyler Black, but Brian Danielson got on the mic and said, you know, I don't trust you, Austin Aries, I definitely do not trust uh, you, uh, Jimmy Jacobs, and I don't know if I can even trust you, Tyler Black, so what if we just change this into a... Uh, Four corner survival, and before that, even when the tag match was announced, they uh, the winner of the match receives a number one contender shot for the ROH World Heavyweight Title. Pretty much, kind of a money in the bank situation without the actual briefcase, where the person can pretty much uh, earn his uh, earn and get their title shot whenever they so inclined to. And um, this was pretty good four corner survival here. I really enjoyed it. You would expect you know these two to put on a very good match. It was, you know, in my opinion, a good to great match. Definitely was the best match of the night on this pay-per-view by far. Um, you saw all of them work very good. Good back and forth action in here. A lot of people with uh, Four Corner Survival, if you've never seen Four Corner Survival, and at first this was uh, announced as a tag team match. Probably a lot of people were confused since they, you know, during Four Corner Survival you do tag rules. Um, unfortunately, I would rather it be, you know, tag rules and plus at the same time tornado rules. I think that would work better for these four corner survivals. And when they do that, it works out better anyway. Um, because a lot of people are like, okay, this is a four corner survival. Then, you know, you don't really see, you know, it's not being a tag match until you finally saw uh, Tyler Black and Danielson do stuff against each other and all snares and Jimmy Jacobs do stuff against each other. Like I said, pretty good match. Um, one point in this match, pretty much towards the end of the match. Uh, you saw Austin Aries, Jimmy Jacobs, and Tyler Black all in the crowd, and Danielson did his dive out to all of them. Then he got on the uh, re uh, the guardrail, celebrated with the fans, and then you saw pretty much out of nowhere uh, Bison Smith come out there. He laid out and attacked Brian Danielson, so Brian Danielson was done in this match. Then the end of the match saw um, Jimmy Jacobs go for the spear on Austin Aries, hit Austin Aries with the spear. Then out of nowhere, Tyler Black pretty much gets a somewhat of an upset victory on Jimmy Jacobs, rolling him up. Pretty good ending. It was good they kind of let Tyler Black, it was good they had Tyler Black go over in this match. So um, on this pay-per-view, Tyler Black was able to get a number one contender shot whenever he's so inclined to. Um, and I would give it about three and a half stars. Like I said, the best match of the evening. And then the uh, next matchup uh, was, uh, well, before the next matchup, they uh, had a uh, preview video package with uh, Nigel McGuinness and El Generico. Then after that, they had a Jerry Lynn backstage promo. Um, pretty much still, you know, Jerry Lynn and Nigel McGuinness were going against each other at that point, and they were slowly building Jerry Lynn to be the next Ring of Honor champion. And you kind of could tell that the way they were building up Jerry Lynn, the way they were doing promos. And I don't have no problem Jerry Lynn now being Ring of Honor champion. The next matchup was uh, Nigel McGuinness versus El Generico for the ROH World Title, and this was about 16, 17 minutes. Very good match here. I really enjoyed it. Um, wasn't an excellent match, but it was a good overall World Title match. Um, especially since at first, you know, it looked like this was just going to be a squash match. The way they did this match was Nigel McGuinness pretty much got most of the offense for the first 10 minutes of this match. Then pretty much the last six, seven minutes, El Generico started getting a little more offense in on Nigel McGinnis and made it seem like Nigel, uh, Nigel McGinnis could almost, you know, lose the title to El Generico. They did a pretty good job making it at least seem like, you know, an upset. And 
that the crowd really helped because you know Nigel McGuinness is so hated by the fans that you know pretty much at this point you know anyone wanted to see pretty much anyone defeat uh, Nigel McGuinness for the title and I think that worked out having El Generico in there he's a huge fan favorite and Nigel McGuinness is a very good heel in Ring of Honor so this match worked out very good. End of the match uh, was Nigel McGuinness retained the ROH World Title like everyone knew it back at this show. This show, like I said, was taped back in January 31st, 2009, and he didn't lose the title until, uh, I think, uh, April 3rd, 2009, and that's going to be a part of the Super Card of Honor 4 DVD that was taped the night before the next pay-per-view, which the next pay-per-view is probably going to be airing during the month of um, June, which is the uh, Take No Prisoners pay-per-view. Um, but this is a pretty good ROH style match. I get three and one four stars. Then uh, the last match was the, uh, the, but not before the last match. After the ROH World Title match, where uh, El Generico tapped out of the London, London Dungeon. That's the way Nigel retained. Uh, Tyler Black came out there and looked like he was going to try to cash in his uh, number one contender shot to get a ROH World Title match. Uh, but out of nowhere, you saw Jimmy Jacobs and Austin Aries come out there and attack him. Then Jimmy. Then Jerry Lynn and Necro Butcher came out there to make the same solo brawl real quick. And Nigel McGuinness pretty much sneaked out through the crowd. So that was the way they uh, did that. Pretty much the way they had the announcer say it. Tyler Black yet again gets screwed again. Then the main event was the Steel Cage Warfare match with uh, Davey Richards, Tank Tolan, Eddie Edwards, Bobby Dempsey, and Adam Pearce. Yeah, this was uh, Adam Pearce's first match back in Ring of Honor and so far is only one back. Since uh, the month of September of 2000, of 2008, that's the uh, this is his first match actually back in Ring of Honor. And this match it made sense him returning and being a part of this match. Then on the other opposing side was uh, Roderick Strong, um, A. Steel, Jay Briscoe, Eric Stevens, and Brent Albright. And this was like I said, Steel Cage Warfare, pretty much war game style rules. And this match just didn't really seem like anything to me. It was just like a pretty bland and boring main event. Um, I gave I gave it three stars because there were at least a few things enjoyable in it, but for the most part, it wasn't anything that was you know an exciting main event. You know, you thought in a war game style match uh, that it would have been a little better. But the one thing is they probably should have give they should have had a little more time in there. I think that's probably the one thing that did kind of hurt this was the match went by a little too quick. I think you know at the longest it was maybe 21 minutes, maybe 22 at best. And um, the end of this match they did did one thing where uh, obviously in any war games match the way the match went was the uh, starting off with uh, Davy Richards and Roger Strong in there. They did had a good beginning, then. Um, Pretty much like any War Games match, the heels get the offense when the first person comes out. Tank Tolan was that, so this was Tank, one of Tank Tolan's first Ring of Honor appearances in a long time. Not that anyone actually cares about seeing him, um, but this is just a pretty bland main event. The way they ended the match was um, all the uh, faces were in the ring. Uh, before that, uh, Jay Briscoe did an insane dive off the top of the cage onto the floor onto a couple people, which that was probably you know the highlight of this match. Uh, then on uh, the end of this match, like I said, all the faces were in the ring, and Adam Pierce was pretty much in there by himself, and they just kept on beating him up. Then finally, Bernard Albright hits the half Nelson suplex onto Adam Pierce for the win for the uh, team of uh, Roger Strong, um, Ro Roger Strong, Ace Steel, Jay Briscoe, Eric Stevens, and Brent Albright to win. And then at the end of the match, this is when um, Bobby Dempsey, you know, storyline wise, finally mans up and you know, sees what Eric, um, Larry Sweeney's trying to do, him, do to him, turns on um, Larry Sweeney, and the faces pretty much beat up Larry Sweeney to end the pay-per-view, and they stand in the ring. Um, pretty, you know, sub subpar main event. I was looking for the main event to be a little better. So overall, like I said, this wasn't a great pay-per-view, wasn't a really necessarily terrible pay-per-view. It was just an average Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Like I said, if you got 10 to $15, you'll at least, you know, want to see the Four Corners Survival match in the ROH World Title match, those matches were pretty good, but it's not one of those that you're going to say, you know, is a great pay-per-view and you'll, you know, uh, get rid of an arm and leg for it. It's not like none of those shows, just an average Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Probably, I would say, one of Ring of Honor's weakest pay-per-views they had so far. But after the last pay-per-view, uh, you know, sometimes pay -per uh, Ring of Honor pay-per-views are going to be like this. Uh, they've had some like this before, like Undeniable, after a very big, 
string of pay-per-views at the beginning when they started doing them. Then they had that, which I never thought Undeniable was really a bad pay-per-view. I actually enjoyed it probably more than a lot of people did. But I would give this pay-per-view right here about a 7 out of 10. Like I said, if you got $10, $15, go out your way to see it. But it's nothing that I would say is a must-see, though. It, like I said, if you are a diehard Ring of Honor fan, you might want to check it out. But if you if you if you miss it, you're not really missing too much uh, to say. And, um, yeah, that's it for my uh, Ring of Honor Cage Collision pay-per-view review. And, yeah, that's it. Peace.